of energy projects. We've talked with Secretaries of Energy and Interior and the FERC commissioners about this important topic over the last several weeks. But this effort to improve our permitting process really took off last summer when I secured a commitment from the President and Democratic Congressional leadership to support permitting reform and bring a bill up for a vote, and we did. After working with a small bipartisan group of members, making some adjustments to incorporate feedback from Republicans that both sides could accept, the Senate voted uh, on the resulting legislation in December of last year. Forty Democrats and seven Republicans supported that bill, which sets permitting deadlines for energy and mineral projects, expedites litigation, requires different agencies to coordinate on reviews, ensure that we got 2 billion cubic feet per day of natural gas into the market through the Mountain Valley Pipeline and much more. This is the only comprehensive energy permitting reform legislation that has received bipartisan support in the Senate. It received support from the majority members on this committee and both the chairman and ranking member of the Environmental Public Works Committee. I reintroduced that bill last week to kickstart bipartisan negotiations again this Congress because we absolutely need to get permitting reform done for the good of our country. It is, uh, it's, is the bill perfect? Absolutely not. Could we go further? Of course. But I was the only Democrat on record supporting the majority of the provisions that Republicans are pushing that weren't included in our compromise legislation. But to get legislation to the Senate, we've got to get 60 votes. That's the process. We can't let the perfect or the politics be the enemy of the good and continue to live with an outdated permitting process that kills much needed projects across the, across the spectrum. Whether you're more inclined towards renewables or fossil, towards pipelines or transmission lines, you can't get anything done unless we can do it in a timely fashion. And we desperately need to get permitting reform done for our country to maintain its status as the leader of the free world. So I'm happy that there is a strong bipartisan interest in permitting reform in this committee and this Congress. We all know that to build an energy system fit for the 21st century, we'll need to ensure our permitting agencies are conducting effective reviews focused on the most important issues, get to decisions much faster, and put a stop to this endless second-guessing of those decisions in court. Now, I'm a believer in all of the above energy policy, which is what Congress has consistently reaffirmed as American energy policy through the Energy Act of 2020, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, and the Inflation Reduction Act. We know that we will need to produce and transport more energy than ever in the coming decades, and that's energy of all types. The Energy Information Administration indicates that the demand for our fossil energy, oil, gas, and coal will increasingly be driven by our allies and trading partners who want a reliable supplier able to produce cleaner than anywhere else. So this means we'll need to build pipelines, export terminals, and more energy transportation infrastructure, or our partners may have to source their fuel from other countries that do not share our democratic or environmental values. I think the only thing you need to look at is Ukraine war. As all, of, uh, all four FERC commissioners last week told us that we cannot eliminate coal today or in the near future if we want to have a reliable grid, electric grid system. We we'll also need to mine and process minerals here in the United States if we're actually serious about lessening our current dependence on China for energy technologies. If we don't, this dependence will get worse. I've been clear that I don't agree with the administration's effort to push an accelerated climate agenda in a way that puts our transportation sector and some components of our energy sector in the hands of China. As a superpower of the world with abundant natural resources and a strong work for workforce, there is no reason that we should be asking others to do what we won't do for ourselves. But producing the American energy that we need and the world needs is nearly impossible with our current permitting system. For example, it takes decades to permit a new, permit a new mine. It's a failure and it's setting us up to rely on countries who are hostile to our way of life. You know you, we have a broken system when getting a domestic mine permitted in less than 10 years is like winning the lottery but it takes less than a year to begin importing products full of critical minerals, mined much more uh, harmful to the environment or processed in China. The Mountain Valley Pipeline has been undergoing permitting litigation for more than eight years. That includes eight NEPA reviews, nine court cases in the Fourth Circuit, and citing permitting litigation and decision-making on how to pay for long-distance, high-voltage transmission lines tie up these projects for over a decade, if they ever get built. These challenges threaten the reliability of our grid system. Some reforms will help all sectors, such as setting and enforcing deadlines, 
expediting litigation, etc. Some will require sector-specific fixes, but no energy sector is immune to permitting roadblocks. Despite every administration and Congress in recent memory in every sector of the energy industry identifying permitting reform as a vital need, the problem is getting worse, not better. As shown in the chart behind me, we're slowing down in building both pipelines and transmission lines. According to the Energy Information Administration, in 2022, we had the lowest amount of FERC-regulated natural gas pipeline infrastructure built since EIA began tracking in 1995. And the story is the same on transmission. In 2021, we built the fewest miles of high-voltage transmission in any year going back to 2010. We all know it's impossible to do, we all know it's possible to do better than five, 10, 15 year timelines without bypassing important environmental protections and community input. Our allies in Australia and Canada have permitting processes designed to finish in three years or less. And in Europe, which has a reputation for being even more difficult to build in than in the US, the weaponization of energy by Russia, Russia forced them to realize that they have a problem. Recently, the EU has rolled out new targets for timelines, nine months to two years for energy, manufacturing, and minerals projects. I repeat, nine months for two to up to two years maximum for energy, manufacturing, and minerals projects. Our committee has a real responsibility to address energy and minerals permitting reform. It's the agencies under our jurisdiction doing most of the permitting for these projects. Over 80% of NEPA environmental impact statements, or the EIS, for energy and mineral projects are completed by agencies under this committee's jurisdiction. And that's almost half of the EISs done across the entire federal government. EISs, environmental impact studies, are extremely cumbersome and take an awful long time, are the most intensive form of NEPA reviews intended for major projects with the potential for significant impacts. They take 4.5 years on average, and often several years beyond that. So the agencies our committee oversees are responsible for a large portion of the federal government, uh, government's most significant and time-consuming environmental reviews. Members of this committee have a wide range of views regarding what the future of American energy should look like. But no matter what you want to build, it simply takes too long. This is why the bill I introduced and 47 bipartisan senators voted for last year would set enforceable timelines for agencies to complete reviews, limit the length of these reviews, and require agencies to coordinate on one government-wide simultaneous review instead of multiple uncoordinated reviews. It would, be accelerated, uh, it, would be, it would accelerate the court process for energy projects by requiring courts to set these cases for expedited review and shortening deadlines to bring lawsuits from six years to less than six months. This will provide certainty that if agencies approve a project, it won't then get delayed by endless litigation. And the bill would also make sure agencies spend most of the time on the most important reviews by ensuring that simple projects are not subject to drawn out reviews. I was pleased to see similar ideas in the bills recently introduced by my, by my Republican colleagues and my uh, ranking member, Senator Barrasso. On electric transmission, our bill recognizes that states have primary authority to cite and allocate the cost for transmission projects. But we made reasonable improvements to FERC's authority to step in in cases where states cannot reach agreement after one year so that long-distance interstate transmission that are in the national interest and needed for reliability of our nation's grid can still move forward. And I've heard my Republican friends concerns about how costs are allocated. So we put language in there to make sure that only those who actually see electric benefits in their states would be, would be required to pay, and that is going to be proportional. By the way, even the oil and gas industry agrees electric transmission reforms are an essential part of comprehensive permitting packages. Six of the leading oil and gas trade groups sent us a letter this morning outlining their top priorities and acknowledging the importance of pairing transmission reforms with steps like improving NEPA and judicial reforms. So it's time for us to all roll up our sleeves and do our jobs. As a chairman of the committee, I'm committed to continuing to convene my colleagues for an open dialogue and negotiation. At this point, we have the legislation I filed that received bipartisan support. 
the House and Senate Republican proposals and Senator Carper's forthcoming proposal on the table. Now, just as we did with the bipartisan infrastructure bill, we all need to sit down and negotiate in good faith. We need to take our names off the bill and go back to a bipartisan permitting reform bill. That's the only way we can take politics out of this. It's not me, it's not John, it's not any of our colleagues. It's getting permitting done for the sake of our country. So I will do everything I can to make that happen. And make no mistake, actually getting something done will require a lot of compromise and prioritization. Many ideas that are prioritized for some senators are strongly opposed by others. We need to respect that in a civil manner. But we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. This is our time to do this. I'm grateful to our witnesses who have joined us today to help discuss what this committee's priorities should be for permitting reform. They represent a diverse group of vendors who all stand to gain from common sense, bipartisan, energy permitting reform. With that, I turn to my friend, Senator John Barrasso, for his opening remarks. Well, thanks so much, Mr. Chairman, for your very thoughtful uh, remarks. Thanks for holding the hearing today. You know, I think back 13 years ago, 2010, nearly two years after President Obama signed his economic stimulus bill into law, um, he seemed to be shocked to discover something that every project developer already knew, and that's, he said, he said, quote, there seems to be no such thing as shovel-ready projects. Uh -huh. Um, and that's because it can take almost forever to get a federal permit. The, uh, in the 13 years since President Obama's comment, things have not really gotten any better. Uh, and under the Biden administration, in my opinion, and in many opinions, uh, they've gotten a lot worse. Our federal permitting process moves in slow motion, too often no motion at all. Uh, even if a project makes it through the thicket of red tape, it can expect to face years of costly litigation after the permitting process. The, the more time it takes, the more money it costs, the, the more likelihood that a developer is just going to pull the plug and not proceed with, with the project. Uh, that means investments aren't made. It means jobs don't materialize. It means new energy and mineral production just doesn't occur. So late last year, The Economist published this chart, and um, it shows that there for the past several years, more miles of interstate natural gas pipelines had been canceled than had been built. More miles canceled than had been built. And as a country, we become better at canceling than at building. The result is what you'd expect. Higher prices, abandoned projects, and stubborn inflation. Uh, and it's an absolute disgrace. So last week, Senator Capito and I introduced legislation to expedite the permitting process while preserving environmental safeguards. The House has passed comprehensive permitting reform. Chairman Manchin has also reintroduced his bill from last year, so there is no shortage of ideas. That makes it all the more important to debate these ideas and move legislation through regular order. I'm glad, that, Mr. Chairman, you're committed to doing that because we have to get it right. Getting it right means adhering to some fundamental principles. First, the legislation must benefit the entire country, not a narrow range of special interests, favored technologies, or a limited group of projects. Reforms must apply equally to all energy sources, traditional and alternative. Second, it must include enforceable timelines to ensure environmental reviews don't drag on for years. Third, it must place limitations on legal challenges to prevent endless litigation intended to kill projects. And finally, it must stop the executive branch from hijacking the permitting process to advance its own narrow and frequently extreme agenda. No longer should the Biden administration get away with reinterpreting legislative language to frustrate the, the will of Congress. Our amendments must leave no ambiguity in what the law requires. The bills that Senator Capito and I have introduced last week meet these criteria. My bill, the Spur Permitting of Underdeveloped Resources, the Spur Act, is co-sponsored by every member of this committee on energy that are Republicans. Our bill will revitalize America's energy sector, lower costs for families, reduce our dependency on China and on Russia. It will hold the Secretary of Interior to her legal obligations on oil, natural gas, and coal leasing on federal lands. No longer should this or any other administration be able to deny, defy, and disregard the law. Our bill will ensure access to minerals essential for renewable and for battery technologies. 
The United States and Wyoming, my home state in particular, is blessed with large deposits of minerals. Responsible use of these resources enhances our national security. Lastly, Mr. Chairman, our bill will provide companies a more predictable permitting process for pipelines, for liquefied natural gas export facilities, and electric transmission lines. Mr. Chairman, we can't let this opportunity pass without enacting anything less than comprehensive reform. And I believe we can pass bipartisan legislation that unleashes American energy and American mineral production, that creates good paying jobs, that lowers consumer prices, and it boosts our national security. So today's hearing, Mr. Chairman, is an important step in that direction. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Brasso. And now we're going to hear from our panel. We have Mr. Mr. Jason Gromay, President and CEO of American Clean Power Association. We have uh, Ms. Elizabeth Schuler, President, American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organizations. We have Mr. Rich Nolan, President and CEO of National Mining Association. And we have to Mr. Paul Ulrich, Vice President of Jonah Energy and member of Wyoming Energy Authority Board of Directors. It's great to have all of you here. And Mr. Gourmet, we'll start with you first. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's really an honor to be here with you and Senator Brasso and this uh, entire committee, and of course, the colleagues here at this panel. So I am Jason Gourmet. I am the CEO of the American Clean Power Association. Our 800 companies provide utility scale clean power from all forms uh, and also spend tremendous amount of time and resources investing in battery storage and transmission when we are allowed to build it. I should also note, Mr. Chairman, that the largest um, producers of clean power in this country also often have commercial interest in oil resources, natural gas, nuclear, and a wide variety of energy sources. So we come to you with a, a big tent. Um, I have already uh, apologized to your staff for the 20 pages of detailed testimony we submitted. Uh, with your indulgence, if I breathe a couple times, I may transgress on the red light by 90 seconds or so. So just a little self-awareness up front. Do your um, best. Mr. Chairman, we have seen what this nation can do when innovation, investment, and our world's greatest workforce is supported with rational, sound public policy. In 2005 and 2007, this committee led landmark pieces of legislation that reclaimed America's role as an energy superpower, improved public health, and dramatically reduced greenhouse gas emissions. I believe we are on the precipice of another breakthrough where we can combine the strength of traditional energy resources with massive deployment of renewable power and storage if we can simply get out of our way and build it. So despite differences and occasional rancor, I think your two opening statements, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, demonstrated that we are in fact coalescing around a shared vision. And that is a vision that prizes innovation and investment over regulation and deprivation. I would um, comment to you and to Senator Murkowski that I think fondly about the many, many times you invited me to testify here, probably between about 2005 and 2015, where I profoundly failed to convince you of your and your colleagues of the benefits of carbon pricing as the anchor of American energy policy. And I credit you and this committee with the 2020 Energy Act, which set forth a true imagination of an all of the above innovation policy. I also note Senator Barrasso, the pleasure I had testifying before you and Senator Carper in 2020, uh, on I believe it was the American Transportation Innovation Act, and my favorite hearing title ever, better, faster, cheaper, smarter, and stronger, infrastructure development opportunities to drive economic recovery and resiliency. So you didn't bury the lead. But what you did at that hearing, along with your colleagues, was talk about the critical importance of permit reform and the ways in which that would also improve environmental quality. So I believe that these efforts three years ago enabled the bipartisan breakthrough on the infrastructure bill, as well as the transition from regulation to innovation that has guided the IRA and our conversation here today. And so I think that's the breakthrough. Now that we actually have line of sight to better, to cleaner, to cheaper, to smarter, and stronger. We, of course, want it faster. So what I would like to do now is say a few words about some proposals around NEPA reform, as well as transmission siting and building that I think can actually move us in that direction. So first on NEPA, we support the series of proposals that have kind of anchored the House and Senate legislation, Senators Manchin, Barrasso, Capito, as well as HR1, as well as what the administration put forward yesterday. Fundamentally, it includes time limits on NEPA actions, elimination of duplicative reviews, and giving lead federal agencies actual authority to drive the process. We also share your both view and commitment that none of these changes will undermine bedrock protections in our environmental laws. And while NEPA reform is necessary, it is unfortunately not sufficient. And so I want to close by discussing the imperative to strengthen and expand our electric grid. 
Now, this is a topic where Congress and ACP's diverse membership have both struggled to build consensus. And so I want to offer some ideas that hopefully will stir the pot in a constructive direction. The data is overwhelming that absent strengthened and expanded transmission capacity, we're going to fall short of achieving our climate, our economic, and our security goals. Recent years have also demonstrated and made us painfully aware that our inability to transfer power between regions can literally be a matter of life and death in emergency situations. So over the past several months, we have challenged ACP's Big Tent membership to confront our internal differences over permitting, planning, and paying, and have provided a discussion framework, which we attached at the back of our testimony. And I'll say a word about interstate siting and then cost allocation. In 17 years, the backstop authority enabling federal action to permit projects of national significance has been used successfully exactly never. And if it were employed, it would take a decade or longer to site and permit a long-distance line. So today, we are proposing reforms that can ensure timely action while respecting the role states still play in this process. Our proposal would reduce the time required to permit these limited number of interstate lines from a decade to between three and four years, and to ensure that this to-date unused authority would serve the purpose Congress intended. I need to note that while supporting these reforms, many ACP members believe that providing FERC with plenary authority to directly permit these high-impact lines would be a more direct and efficient path to increase grid reliance and low-cost clean power. On cost allocation, while FERC Order 1000 created a workable approach for the lines that exist within a region, the process for planning for transmission that spans more than one region is unworkable. It subjects project developers to an impossible triple hurdle requiring separate approvals by each region and then a, air quote, coordinated interregional approval process, which is literally designed to fail because different regions apply different evaluation metrics and have no obligation or incentive to consider full project benefits. If this is hard to envision, I like to think of it as the efficiency of the United Nations, just take away the translators. So finally, Mr. Chairman, the proposal we are offering for consideration provides a system that is designed to succeed by obligating regions to jointly evaluate these lines following a set of criteria established by FERC, so the true benefits of these lines will be, in fact, appreciated and not ignored. Now, in the last 24 hours, some friends and even some ACP family have criticized our proposal arguing that even a well-designed path forward will fall victim to parochial interests. Others have embraced the pragmatism of the approach while suggesting that more is needed. For example, adding a minimum transfer capacity requirement. And still others believe that even this approach inappropriately transgresses upon state and federal prerogative. So I'm not aware of a single one of my 800 members who believe we are proposing a perfect solution. But everyone recognizes the status quo is harming our national interests and are eager to accelerate constructive debate. In closing, Mr. Chairman, all energy technologies have weaknesses. I am convinced that if we combine the collective strength of the diverse array of energy resources in this country, we can create a new energy economy by mid-century that addresses our economic security and climate imperatives. At the end of the day, this process has to do two things. First, the solution needs to work. It has to be meaningful. And second, it needs to pass. ACP is eager to work with this committee to come up with a practical consensus that can open the next chapter of America's energy dominance. Appreciate the time. You only went over 120 seconds, not nine. <clears throat> I tried. Close. But it was great, great opening. Uh, Mr. Nolan, you'll be next. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Barrasso, members of the committee. It's a pleasure to be here. I will endeavor to uh, stick with the time limit. Thank you. We'll see how it goes. The National Mining Association appreciates the opportunity to discuss the urgent need to strengthen our domestic supply chains to secure American energy resources and to protect reliable electri electricity generation. Domestic mining conducted under world-leading environmental safety and labor standards is essential to virtually every supply chain, and the right policies are needed to unlock our full potential from resources not overseas, but right here at home. Uranium and coal, which provide 40% of the nation's electricity, are key sources of baseload power, generation that's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Copper, cobalt, lithium, silver, are essential components to EV batteries and the electrification of the economy. 70% of the world's steel requires, requires metallurgical coal for its production, and it takes 100 metric tons of met coal to build a wind turbine. Bayrite and Mali support oil and gas production. In short, a strong domestic mining industry makes America's energy security possible. The mining industry is also the source of high-paying, stable, and often unionized jobs that provide generous benefits. We directly employ more than 475,000 people who make an average wage of $85,000 a year. 
These direct jobs support an additional 800,000 indirect jobs. Each year, our industry generates more than $119 billion in revenues for the U.S. economy, paying more than $18 billion in federal, state, and local taxes. Last year, federal coal production produced over $576 million in revenue for federal and state governments. Demand for mine materials is expanding exponentially, but we have not seen corresponding actions to support increased production of these critical mine materials. Instead, we have deepened our reliance on foreign sources of mine materials. And in 2022, the U.S. reached its highest level of mineral import reliance. We are more dependent now than ever on China, Russia, and other countries for mine materials we should be sourcing right here at home. Each new announcement of a blocked domestic mine locks in our competitive weakness and weakens our national security. Without permitting reform, we will be watching the global competition for minerals and energy control from the sidelines. Providing additional funding or tax incentives for programs that will never be approved by our government does nothing. It takes an average of 10 years to permit a new mine, one of the longest permitting timelines in the world. As Mining Subcommittee Chairman Cortez Mastro has long said, we can protect the environment and still do the mining that's necessary. However, our unwieldy and needlessly complex permitting process can trap promising mining projects in limbo of, dupl of duplicative and endless costly reviews. On federal lands, U.S. coal producers are experiencing a moratorium on leasing for thermal coal and delays in granting metallurgical coal leases. Thermal coal producers are feeling in the impact of federal regulation issued at a rate which experts such as FERC warn threatens our grid reliability. Chairman Manchin has consistently stated there is an overwhelming bipartisan recognition that our current permitting system is not working. And it may firmly agrees. This Congress has a unique opportunity to enact meaningful permitting legislation. The American Energy Security Act, the SPUR Act, and the Restart Act are common sense solutions. These bills prioritize development and certainty to mining communities, companies, and manufacturers and investors. By establishing lead agencies, coordinating state and federal processes, improving the timeliness of reviews, and maintaining mineral access and shoring up our, the reliability of the electric grid are all essential. We have an abundant mineral and coal resource, res, resources right here at home, and the U.S. mining industry stands ready to supply our country with a full range of mine materials needed to move our nation forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. And now we'll go to President Schuler. Thank you, Chairman Manchin, Ranking Member Barrasso, and members of the committee for the chance to speak to you today on this very important topic. I'm bringing the voices of 12 and a half million working people with me into the room today, 60 different unions across every sector of the economy um, here with me uh, as part of the AFL-CIO. Permitting reform is a top priority for the AFL-CIO. Every job in every part of the energy sector and the manufacturing sector depends on permitting and siting. Mining of critical minerals that we need for the transition, electricity transmission, which is key to expanding renewable energy, pipelines and other infrastructure that we need for hydrogen and CCS, manufacturing, power generation, especially wind, solar, and nuclear. Thanks to the Biden administration and this Congress, we have a historic opportunity to create more than a million good union jobs, make our infrastructure world leading, and set our country on track for secure domestic supply chains in mining, energy, and manufacturing. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the Chips and Science Act, the Inflation Reduction Act are that opportunity. They set us on a path towards a clean energy, high-tech economy. Permitting reform is absolutely necessary to realize the full job creation and emissions reduction potential of these three bills. Full, implement, um, full implementation of the IRA alone will create more than a million new jobs and bring down emissions across the economy. But without permitting reform, job creation will be more modest, and emissions could actually go up. So let me give you an example of how delays in permitting can affect job creation and emissions. The TransWest Express Transmission Project is a $3 billion transmission line. 
Once built, it will add 3,000 megawatts of transmission capacity across four states to ship more renewable power to areas of high demand in the West. Construction will create approximately 700 International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers jobs alone. It took 18 years for this project to get final approval. 18 years of additional costs for the developers and 18 years of lost economic opportunities for workers during this period. I mentioned construction and manufacturing, but I want to point out that this issue affects all of us, every worker and every American. Do we want our children to be able to drink clean water, hold off the worst impacts of climate change, rebuild our roads, our bridges, our crumbling infrastructure, set up our economy to win for the next 100 years? I think that answer is yes. All of that requires us acting with urgency and justice. And if I can leave you with one thought today, it's that we can do both. We can make this process more effective and efficient. We can make sure that good union jobs lift up black workers, brown workers, vulnerable communities, Americans who've been left behind for far too long. When things move too slowly, when projects take over a decade to permit, we all get hurt. Fewer good paying union jobs, fewer opportunities for workers of color, and progress on union jobs and clean energy that is just too slow for communities that desperately need change. I wanna be very clear, that does not come at the expense of the rights of states, tribes, communities, or other stakeholders to have an effective voice in the process or to formally intervene. Public participation is key. Uh, it's a key feature of the permitting process. So we urge Congress to preserve it while also significantly improving the efficiency of the process. But I can say unequivocally, on behalf of the labor movement, we need three things. We need, number one, certainty. We need to know when a final decision will be made and that it is, in fact, final. That certainty is what allows companies to make commitments to suppliers, to contractors, and workers. It's how communities can really believe that investment and jobs are coming. The second thing, we need speed. We need to deploy a full range of clean energy technology much faster than we ever have. And this requires more transmission and more critical minerals so we can have secure domestic supply chains and not depend on China. And third, we need consistency. As much as possible, we are looking for a standardized process that can apply to all forms of permitting for all technologies. So the bottom line here is that we have a once in a generation opportunity right now, thanks to the IIJA and the IRA that you and the Biden administration worked so hard to get through. We can protect ourselves from the climate crisis, bring justice, to workers and communities, create more than a million new good union jobs, and set our entire country up for success. And American workers are ready to do our part. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, Senator Barrasso. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to introduce Mr. Paul Ulrich, who is here as one of our witnesses for today's hearing. Uh, Paul, thanks for traveling in from Pinedale, Wyoming, to be with us here in the nation's capital. Uh, Paul is on the board of directors and the former president of the Wyoming Energy Authority, which leads our state's energy strategy. Paul is also vice president of government and regulatory affairs at Jonah Energy, uh, one of the largest natural gas producers in Wyoming. Paul has worked in the oil and natural gas sector for almost 25 years. He is an expert on operating on federal lands. Before his career in the energy sector, Paul was an intelligence specialist in the United States Navy. So we're de deeply grateful for your service to the country and to the state of Wyoming, as well as for an opportunity to hear from you today. Please, pr please proceed. Thank you, Chairman Manchin, and a special thank you to my U.S. Senator, Ranking Member Barrasso, for the invitation to speak. I really appreciate it. Uh, Jonah Energy is an oil and gas exploration and production company, and we operate, uh, as the good senator said, in the Jonah and Pinedale fields up in Wyoming. Our business is producing natural gas in an environmentally responsible manner, and I think that's critical. I'm really immensely proud to be part of a team at Jonah Energy with that shared vision of providing some of the nation's cleanest natural gas, all on federal lands. 
The Wyoming Energy Authority is responsible for advancing our diverse energy strategy, all of the above in Wyoming, and empowering our nation with our goal in Wyoming of a net zero energy mix down the line. Clean natural gas projects, wind projects, CO2 sequestration pipelines, and believe it or not, even wildlife conservation efforts are severely limited by unacceptably long review times, endless litigation, and never-changing regulations. Today, Congress has an opportunity to lead our nation into a cleaner and a low-carbon economy through meaningful permit reform. The world needs affordable and reliable energy, and those needs are growing. I think it's important that we also acknowledge that all energy sources have an environmental impact and stop the bias against hydrocarbons. It's important to recognize the work being done to provide natural gas that is produced in a less impactful way. And we get better and better and better every day. We must address permitting and litigation challenges that continue to hamper our ability to progress both domestic and globally. We almost all Excuse me, we must also enhance our LNG export capacity in order to provide our low emission American natural gas to the world. States in the West with a large amount of public land are at a decided disadvantage to other parts of the country. Leasing, environmental reviews, permitting, and ultimately any source of energy development can take years, if not decades, longer on private land. Some examples, Chokecherry Sierra, Sierra Madre Wind Project, 12 years of NEPA permitting. TransWest was just discussed. Uh, that is critical new infrastructure from Wyoming and Wyoming Wind to deliver renewable resources to California, Nevada, and Arizona. Nearly 15 years of NEPA permitting alone. In the past 15 years, the time frames for environmental analysis on oil and gas project range from six to 10, 12 years. The average time to process an APD to drill a well has increased by 124% from 2018 to 2022, averaging 271 days. The effects of litigation on federal and oil and gas permission, uh, permitting in Wyoming are also significant. Several lawsuits challenge lease sales in Wyoming, as well as lease sales in other states held between 2015 and 2020. Bottom line is the effect of these cases is the BLM isn't approving drilling permits or any other action on 2.1 million acres of oil and gas leases in Wyoming today and won't be for the foreseeable future. For most of these acres, BLM is effectively self-enjoining itself from approving development. This is new and unprecedented uh, and has effectively halted any development on valid existing rights with no end in sight. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, supply matters. With the additional natural gas pipelines, we can develop a market for low emission American natural gas that will support global climate goals through export as LNG and also support all allies' growing need for a reliable source of energy. And we can build this infrastructure that enhances our existing natural gas backbone and provides for the potential of green hydrogen and ammonia export. So, Recommendations, enact meaningful and leasing permitting reform, amend, strengthen, and protect our foundational energy statutes, limit or eliminate the ability of agencies to enact moratoriums or other administrative roadblocks, uh, and uh, as always, adhere to enforceable deadlines, and strengthen uh, our mandate of multiple use. Expedite judicial review periods, limit venue shoppings, enact reasonable statute of limitations, and certainly require agencies to rigorously defend in a timely manner their decisions. And obviously, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, we want to prioritize and accelerate approval for new interstate natural gas pipelines, LNG terminals, and related infrastructure. In closing, Wyoming resources support our national strength, our security in a fundamental way. We're also leading efforts to significantly reduce environmental impacts from all sources of energy. We can and must work together to achieve meaningful permitting reform. It's necessary to achieve our full potential of energy reliability and security, as honestly, we in Wyoming and we in this nation lead the globe in a cleaner energy evolution. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member.
Thank you all for your testimony. I appreciate it very much. I'm going to ask very quick questions because we only have limited time. Have you all seen an uptick in the last year or two since we've passed pieces of monumental legislation, bipartisan infrastructure, IRA? Have you seen more investments, more activity, more desire to do more in America than ever before, or have you not? Mr. Chairman, uptick would be an understatement. There is an absolute surge of activity. In just the last nine months, private sector capital, $150 billion of announced investment in clean energy, 47 domestic manufacturing facilities between September and April, 11 more since we put this report. We can't put the report out monthly anymore. We have to update it weekly. Okay. So there is an incredible opportunity, but I have to say, as you pointed out, it's going to get harder, not easier unless we open up the space. Well, we all know that there's be a lot of money to be stranded. It'll never get out the door because we'll run out of time and the time element to do the things will be done, and we'll still be trying to figure out how to permit, and nobody will be happy. Uh, Rich, Mr. Nolan, real quick. Absolutely. Um, we have seen a, a rush, a gold rush, as a matter of fact, in some battery materials investments in mines in the United States. However, um, the permitting juggernaut is proving to be extremely difficult. I believe... Uh, we learned just yesterday only really two mines have been approved. The rest have been some exploration work. So you're done, seeing the so. uptick basically in renewables, but it's not, not the aggressiveness as far as the uptick in fossil. Correct. Ms. Schuller. I would say yes. Uh, we are talking a lot at the national level about the opportunity coming our way and trying to ramp up uh, training and workforce readiness and looking at that talent pipeline that's going to be needed. But I will say, um, you know, we've heard promises before from the federal government and workers are, you know, the best way that we can show them that this is different is to get the shovels in the ground and get the projects moving, make it a reality. Sure. Yep. Mr. Chairman, the desire is there. Uh, certainly in Wyoming, we are in an all-of-the-above state. We are eager, ready, willing, able uh, to get to work producing some of the cleanest energy, whether it be natural gas, coal, uh, uh, wind, et cetera. Yeah. Well, let me just say this. The people have to understand the, piece, the IRA legislation was done in a balanced way. We have to have the horsepower to run the country for today with the investments to, des to develop and mature the technologies for tomorrow. And right now, they're having a hard time. You follow me? One wants more of this, one wants less of this, one wants more of this or less of this. We tied them together that you're not going to be able to put wind or solar anywhere unless we're extracting the resources that we have to in a balanced way for the 10-year period. We all agree that we need to stabilize the grid. So I would ask all of you, not right now, I could ask you to rapid fire, but I want you to think about this before we end this committee hearing. I want you to put your top three impediments whether it be whatever desire, whether it be for renewables, whether it be for gas, oil, and coal, whatever, what's the top three impediments that you think need to be, your highest priority need to be changed in a permitting bill? What we have is we have different variations of permitting. We have things in, in Senator Brasso's bill that we agree and maybe have challenges we don't agree. We have things in, in, in our bill that they agree or don't agree. We're going to, by, by uh, importance and prioritization, we're going to figure a bipartisan bill that all of us can agree on and come out of this committee. And that's what really makes that that'll be the momentum we're going to need to make this happen. So your input's going to be absolutely unbelievably helpful for us to get through this maze. And as we do it, and I'm, uh, I would just say for the committee's sake, we're intending to get this bill and have a bill on the floor before we have a recess this summer. That's pretty aggressive. We're going to get it done. We are going to get it done. It's imperative, and we lead the rest of the world. So with that, I have, let me see, another, I had another question. And just, I just want to throw this out to you real quickly. Uh, Mr. Nolan, on, on hard rock mining. Hard rock mining, nothing's been changed for years. No, I can't believe it. I come from the mining industry and understand mining very well. We pay for everything. They pay for nothing. There's no royalties. There's no nothing. There's no, basically, bonding for tailings and this and that. If we're going to do mining reform, don't you think it should be done across the board, everyone's treated fair? <laughs> Thank you for the question, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I'll, att I'll attempt an answer. Um, we're happy to work with the committee in a bipartisan way. That's all we can ask for. To, to improve uh, the process of mining in this country, to make sure we're globally competitive, 
What we're, what we're saying is basically simply this. When we're mining, and basically we have our waste from our mining, it should be done and disposed of in a proper way and reclaimed properly. You should have a bond that basically says you'll do it in case you go bankrupt. That bond is sufficient to cover what you didn't do. And if you're mining, extracting resources that we, the people of America, own under BLM land, shouldn't you pay some royalty the same as you would pay for a private owner? Happy to work with you, sir. Okay. I don't think that was a good question, was it? That was just pretty much a statement I've been trying to make. I'm sorry I had to use you for that, for my prop. Okay. I appreciate it. With that, I'm going to turn to my, my ranking member, Senator Brasso. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Ulrich, you know, your testimony described a number of obstacles to developing oil and gas on federal lands at home in Wyoming. Uh, one of the most significant is uncertainty around the Bureau of Land Management, their lease sales. Uh, since President Biden took office, the Bureau has defied the law and held only, what, one lease sale in the last nine quarters, so almost two years. Uh, what changes to the Bureau's leasing process would be most effective in providing some certainty for producers going forward? Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, Member Brasso, first things first, uh, actually holding quarterly lease sales uh, and, and adhering to that mandate would be critical. Uh, also, a, a very significant uh, uh, issue with the entire NEPA process is layer upon layer upon layer of NEPA analysis. If we had up-to-date, effective, and timely resource management plans to address all of our resources and expedite lands that should and should not be leased, that would be very effective as well. So before the Bureau can hold an oil and gas lease sale, it needs to conduct multiple rounds of environmental analysis. Uh, the reviews determine which lands are open to be, le to be leased and under what conditions. Before the Bureau can approve drilling permits on these leases, it conducts further rounds of environmental analysis. Can you talk about this duplicative process and the protracted environmental review process in terms of oil and gas production on federal lands and explain how Congress can help fix this broken process? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Brasso, uh, the process is laborious to say the least. Uh, uh, clearly, prior to lands being leased, there's an environmental re review. Uh, prior to that, there are overreaching resource management plans on federal lands that uh, are, are set in place to guide development and conservation and all other environmental resources uh, for a very uh, long period of time. Once you get a lease, you either go through an EA or a five to 10 year process for an EIS. After that, typically you'll have to go down to an APD level where you might need to get an environmental assessment and other impact analysis as well. So Mr. Chairman, you can see the challenge. Uh, if we had stronger, more effective resource management plans and we could tier from those resource management plans and tier from one solid set of environmental reviews and process quickly with hard deadlines, uh, you could save an enormous amount of time throughout the entire process. Uh, thank you. M Mr. Nolan, the, the Biden administration wants to do a, quote, carbon-free electric grid by 2035 and a net zero carbon economy by 2050. It plans to reach this goal through the widespread adoption of electric vehicles and solar and wind uh, electric generation. So electric vehicles use over six times more minerals than vehicles with internal combustion engines. Solar panels require roughly five times more minerals than natural gas generation per me megawatt hour. Offshore wind requires roughly 12 times more minerals than natural gas generation per megawatt hour. So under the current permitting laws, is there any way in the world to meet the president's goals without dramatically increasing America's dependence on China and on Russia? Thank you for the question, uh, Senator. Global investment in U.S. mining has dropped in half over the past 20 years. Um, industry surveys on where to invest continues to report the U.S. has lost attractive, attractiveness due to the uncertainty in the permitting process and the regulatory and legal environment and tort systems. Um, so I would say, you know, the Chinese started this process of investments from um, mining both at home and overseas as well as standing up a robust processing and uh, smelting platform in, in China. So they are 20 years ahead of us. And it's, it's now time for us to catch up if we're going to meet the needs. So 
of the electrification of the economy and the EVs. Yeah. So, so how critically important is access to federal lands right here in the United States for future mineral production in this country if you're going to want to meet these goals that the administration has come up with? Uh, incre incredibly important. The minerals are where they are. We don't get to decide that. Now, there are certain areas that we have to look out for and be very careful with, and we are. We have the highest labor environmental standards in the world here at home. Um, so uh, your, your point is well taken. Mr. Grummet, do you disagree with anything that Mr. Nolan just said? I appreciate the opportunity, Senator. No, I wanted to indicate that we agree both with the frame of your question and Mr. Nolan's answer. And I think that fundamentally our only opportunity not just to achieve our climate goals, but our security goals are going to require significant investments in infrastructure, in mining, in production, in manufacturing. And I think that's good news for the country. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I listen to this discussion, I can't help but be reminded of an incident in the Old Testament that's not widely known. When God came to Moses and said, Moses, I have good news and bad news. Moses said, what's the good news, God? God said, I'm going to enable you to part the waters of the Red Sea and let my people go free. Then the part waters of the Red Sea will recommence and bury Pharaoh's army. Moses said, that's wonderful, God. What's the bad news? God said, you prepare the environmental impact statement. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's important as, as I listen to the discussion here today, no one, not a single witness and no one at this dais has talked about lowering environmental standards. I haven't heard a, a word about that. When I was governor of Maine, my mantra was the highest environmental standards in the country and the most timely and predictable permitting process. Those two things are not inconsistent. And the outline of what we're discussing here today, it seems to me, is pretty clear. Deadlines, some limitation on the length of time that litigation takes, one-stop shopping so that there is a rational process that's not, seri not uh, serial but, but parallel. The, the outline is, is, is pretty clear. I come at this as a person who has been involved in the environmental movement for 40 years. In order to achieve our environmental goals, we have to build things. You cannot love EVs and hate lithium mines. 87% of the lithium, and by the way, this is a national security issue as well as an environmental issue. 87% of the lithium today in use in EV batteries, that's pro the processed lithium comes from China. That's a national security issue. It's also, we're talking about environmental issues. Bill McKibben had a very important article just a week ago in Mother Jones. The name of the article is Yes in Our Backyards. And he talks about his evolution as an environmental leader that started from blocking things in the 60s and 70s and realizing that in order to achieve an environmental future, whether it's transmission or, or mining critical minerals, in order to achieve a green energy future, we have to build things. And so I welcome the testimony that you all have provided today. The 18 years for the transmission line is a perfect example. Whenever my staff tells me it's going to take a couple of years to do something, you can, I'll share this with you. I always remind them that Eisenhower retook Europe in 11 months. That was a pretty daunting task. And I believe that what we need to do is talk about and we can talk about whether what the, it should be two years or three years or what it should be. Also shorten the, 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 the time limit to file litigation. As, as the chairman said, the litigation should be on a, uh, on a fast track docket, not to deny people their voice, but to be sure that they speak up in a timely way. Because we cannot achieve the environmental goals that, that many of us share without permitting reform. So one specific question, Mr. Grumman, uh, the permitting, the Federal Permitting Council, mm. I'm worried about the future of that. Do you see that as a useful organization? Could they be the, the wrangler here that could help us to move this process forward? Uh, thank you, Senator King. Um, I think uh, PIPSI Permitting Council has actually proven shockingly effective, right? I think if you look at things like, well, I guess it was the Sunzia line, right? A big power line had been stuck for about 15 years. There were a lot of DOD concerns. It got put on the dashboard, and it got done in two years. So I think bringing that kind of focus, you know, you manage what you measure. And so I think we've joked that at times we've had challenges when it comes to science 
And sometimes we're having challenges when it comes to math, right? We need to have actual limitations to ensure that we get these projects built. I think what the administration released yesterday also confirms this idea that a two-year expectation, regardless of the number of agencies involved, is appropriate. So I think uh, FIPSI having the authority to drive that process forward makes a lot of sense. What about shortening the, uh, st the time period to, for litigation from years to months? Yeah. So I don't think we have a, a formal position on judicial reform, but I will note that um, no deadlines, which basically allows a six-year window to challenge a process, seems a little unnecessary. I think that the FAST Act, which moved that deadline to two years for transportation projects, seems like a constructive direction. I know Senator Manchin's legislation has even stricter. So I think I can't give you a month, but 72 is probably too many. I think one of the things that's important to realize here is that we're, we're all talking about projects that get delayed or, or t take a long time, and it, it's a lengthy and cumbersome process. What we don't know are all the projects that never even get to the stage of being proposed, uh, the, the, the opportunity cost, if you will. Uh, because if, a, if a, a utility or a developer or a mining company is contemplating a project, one of their considerations is how long will it take and how much will it cost before I can actually start to realize any return on the investment. So I think, Mr. Chairman, this is an important hearing. I appreciate your uh, bringing it forward. And uh, uh, as a uh, card-carrying environmentalist, I look forward to working with you to solve this problem. Thank you. Anyway, we have Senator Hyde-Smith next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We are certainly at a critical moment in time with permitting reform, and I'm from Mississippi. For the past two years, we have seen the negative effects of permitting delays on domestic energy production and consequently the high energy prices paid by American families and American industry, American businesses, but for Issues such as offshore oil and gas leasing, DNEPA reform, and onshore electric transmission, permitting should be streamlined to get us back on track to becoming energy independent. But uh, Mr. Gourmet, with respect to transmission facilities, there are proposals under consideration that would limit a state's role in these projects that are deemed by the federal government to be of national interest. What roles do you believe states should have in planning electric transmission projects, and do you think it is appropriate to reduce or eliminate the state's ability to participate in that planning, especially if the customers they represent will be required to pay for a portion of the project's cost? So, Senator, that is the crucible of the question, and um, there's about 17 pages of my testimony that I will not try to summarize in about 45 seconds. The current system does not work, fundamentally broken. We have a balkanized power grid that is isolating communities of the country from one another, and that's why when we have tragedies like we saw with Winter Storm Uri, people are dying because we do not have connections between the different power grids. So the key to making our nation stronger cleaner, more secure, is to connect those regions together. And so the question we have to ask is, well, why is it not happening? It's not happening because the current processes do not create any incentive for the different regions to work together. And so the status quo does not work. Moving to a direct federal preemption, I think, is going to be very hard to convince this committee to agree to. So we've proposed what we think are some pretty thoughtful process steps that would maintain the state's role, both in permitting and also in the efforts to kind of connect these regions, but put some process behind it that's rational. So on siting, instead of having to wait for the states to move forward, we can use the backstop authority that was already put into law, give states a chance to move forward with that permitting, but have the federal government have a response if states fail to act. It is not taking them out of the process, it's just requiring them to work within the process. On the issue of cost allocation, which is more complicated, we believe that the regions have a role to play, but we believe that they have to play that role. They can't rope it up the nation into energy insecurity. And so we think there's a way forward that does not either accept the dysfunctional status quo or accept what I think people fear is an over-federalization. And it's time for the Congress to, I think, dig in and find those solutions. And in your opinion, how should transmission planners determine whether an electric transmission project is a high-impact transmission project or of national interest? 
So I think that the criteria that were set out uh, in EPACT, I think, and reinforced by IIJA, and I think Senator Manchin has added to that, we've indicated a list of what we think are the kind of criteria to understand what a national interest project looks like. But that does not dictate approval. I think once you are in that process, then what the states need to do is look in a coordinated way at the benefits within their own borders, and then also at the regional benefits that both you know, states and regions would benefit from with those connections. But they should be the regular ways we look at the benefits of power. It should be economic. These are not trying to figure out a kind of woke national agenda. It is basically providing economic development, jobs, safety, security, re resilience, reliability. They should use the system that they're working through right now, but they actually have to speak the same language. Right now, there is no incentive for any region to think about the full benefits of a project, and as a result, the whole country is suffering. Well, should promoters of these projects, should they be required to show that the projects resolve a specific identified customer need? Every one of these projects has to be justified based on the benefits to customers being greater than the costs. There is absolutely no reason to move forward with a project that does not do that. But we have to recognize that there are benefits greater than what you're playing in your, you know, per kilowatt hour. It's a benefit for your lights not to go out. It's a benefit for your region to be able to be saved with power if you have a terrible storm. It's a benefit for you to have the capacity to bring new industries into your region. It is a benefit to have low power, low cost power brought to you from other parts of the country. So I think as long as we have an honest conversation anchored in economic benefits, we can make the decisions that protect all of our shareholders and consumers. Thank you for your answer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to all of you for being here to get today. And um, so let me start with uh, with Jason, uh, Mr. Grummet. Um, as you as you may know, I supported the efforts to permanently reauthorize the FAST 41 permitting process, which I think is a real critical tool that helps large projects navigate the federal permitting process. And it's especially critical that the federal permitting process doesn't needlessly delay projects that can help us secure the domestic supply of critical minerals uh, that help us uh, fight climate change. So earlier this year, um, there's a project called South 32, Hermosa Critical Minerals Project, will become the first mining project added, project added to the um, country's Fast 41 process. And the Hermosa project is a proposed zinc and manganese mining and processing operation in Santa Cruz County, Arizona, near the U.S.-Mexico border. And demand for manganese uh, from the battery sector is predicted to increase at the fastest rate of any of the industry's key metals. And this Hermosa project is the only advanced mine development project in the nation that can produce two federally designated critical minerals, making it essential for securing the country's domestic supply of critical minerals. You know, making the rigorous environmental review and permitting process for this type of project more transparent, timely, and predictable is going to help us establish the country as a responsible producer of critical minerals and renewable energy. So, Mr. Grummet, um, <clears throat> How does, the, how does the expansion of the program into mine approval benefit the clean power sector, and will it strengthen our supply chain with American resources? So, Senator Kelly, I appreciate the question. I appreciate your leadership on FAST 41. And to the core of my testimony, that the nation is coalescing now around a shared vision, I bet that uh, Mr. Nolan and I would answer this question exactly the same. Fundamentally, our capacity to address our economic, climate, and security needs requires more mining, particularly of critical minerals. We cannot achieve our goals for electrification of transportation. We cannot achieve our goals for battery storage, which is necessary to provide resiliency for our intermittent renewable resources without projects just like the Hermosa project. Fast 41 works. You put the spotlight on something, and the government responds. And so if it works for a power line, if it works for a solar facility, if it works you know, for an offshore wind farm, it should work for mining. And so I think we fundamentally support an all of the above competition, but it's got to be a competition towards national goals. 
So we would like every single technology and all of the resources and infrastructure to support those technologies to have the same federal support. But we have to recognize that we have open minds, not empty minds. It's to achieve security, economic resilience, and climate imperatives. And how much time does the FAST 41 program typically save? Uh, two years has become, I think, the kind of default idea of how you can run rigorous NEPA processes, bring in community involvement, and come up with a decision. Okay, and then what can we do to uh, work with states to incentivize states to participate in FAST 41 to keep these projects on track? So, you know, at the end of the day, it all comes down to federalism. And I think we obviously have to provide encouragement for states to want to be part of that federal process. I think the idea around revenue recycling where some of the resources from the permit applications are brought back into the states, I think is a very smart way to move forward. Also, early consultation. It's always good to talk to people at the front end, whether that's a state regulator, whether that's the environmental justice community, whether that's a local farmer or landowner. So I think with revenue recycling and with efforts that bring the voices to the front of the process, and then with demonstrated success, I think you're gonna see states much more eager to be part of those solutions. Well, thank you. And uh, in my remaining time, I want to just ask Ms. Schuler. I'm sure you're aware of the Navajo generating station, uh, the situation here and uh, the closure uh, in 2019. <clears throat> and this is associated with the uh, Kienta Mine project. And it's, you know, it, it did provide uh, very high paying jobs in the area that has high unemployment. So uh, how is permitting reform connected to well paying jobs in communities that may already have, uh, you know, some issue with a transition like a closure of a uh, power station. Absolutely, and, and some of those folks were union members, so I am familiar with that situation, and I think this is what we're talking about as older energy assets are faded, uh, phased out, closed. Um, we need to have the promise of good union high wage, high road jobs available. It's what people keep calling a just transition, mm -hmm. but we have yet to see a truly just transition. And so that's why the investments that are coming, IRA in particular, have such promise for places like the Navajo Nation where there are special incentives that can be targeted in places that are already primed and ready to go. And we want to make sure that there are good um, uh, high wage standards attached to these incentives so that indeed they do produce, you know, this apples to apples kind of if we are leaving a good high wage job, you don't want to land in a, in a job that's actually going to be a dead end job. So that's why it's so important to get those right. Thank you, Ms. Schuller. Thank you, Senator. Now we have Senator Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the panel. Thank you for, um, for sharing your, your, your views, your comments on the importance, the priority of permitting reform. You know, you feel like you've, you've reached that sweet spot when everybody's talking about permitting reform for all of the right reasons. And so I think this, uh, this puts us at a, at a good place to actually, hopefully, get something done. I, I want to take us back um, just a just couple years ago because we it's not like we've been sitting on our hands when it comes to permitting. We were able to to put in place what I consider some some common sense mineral permitting reforms in the bipartisan infrastructure law. We we kind of pulled this from the American Mineral Security Act that I was able to work on with the, with the chairman here. It was certainly a, a first step. Maybe it was maybe it was too small. Um, but what we were trying to do was to give the administration some, some new tools to work with. Let me direct this to you, Mr. Nolan. Um, have you seen any meaningful steps that the administration has taken uh, to utilize its new authorities under the bipartisan infrastructure law? And, and is, there, is there more that we can be doing out there? I recognize what we're talking about today is all of the follow-on that we need to do, but are there things that we've actually put into law that perhaps we haven't um, amped up or ramped up enough? Well, I want, first off, I want to commend uh, you, Senator Murkowski, for all your historical work on permitting reform and the legislation that passed as part of the Infrastructure Act, uh, working with the chairman. Um, unfortunately, the congressionally mandated report about improvements that could be made to our mining process was due under statute to, to the Congress on November 15th of 2022. So um, we're still waiting for that analysis, and that would be very helpful to the process before us again here 
here today. Uh, instead, the interiors so wrapped that. Urge them along on that report then. Yeah, they, yeah. they've wrapped that, um, complying with that important provision to the interagency working group on mining and mining reform. And um, that's really not what the directive was from this committee. So um, there's a little frustration. It's been six months now since they missed the deadline, and we'd love to see that come forward so we can get going. Okay, okay, that's, that's, a, that's a good heads up for us. I, I'm gonna put this out to all of you. Um, we've got, we've got four, four essentially primary bills here um, in the Senate that would work to reform permitting. Um, you've, got, you've got the House Pass Bill, you've got Chairman Manchin's measure, you have a Ranking Member Brasso's Spur Act, and then you have um, Ranking Member Capito's Restart. So great to have four good bills. I think they provide a, a lot of good ideas, a good opportunities to really move us forward. Um, but we all know around here, you're not gonna get anywhere if you've got four bills and everybody's kind of jockeying for position or I wanna have mine over, over somebody else's. So I think we're gonna have to figure out what this actually looks like. Um, so I was, I was, I was gonna frame the question, um, how, how we can all get on this same page with permitting reform with the things that have to be in it. Maybe the most important thing to think about is what can't be in it. In other words, you know, there may be some things that we're seeing in, in other areas where we're looking at and saying, this is, this is not gonna be helpful to us. Um, is there anything out there that you're looking at when we're thinking about permitting reform and you're saying from our perspective, whether from a workforce perspective, from a from a clean renewable, from a mining, that this shouldn't this shouldn't just shouldn't be part of the deal. So I'm going to ask you to think what shouldn't be in rather than should be. Anybody have any comments there? You're all smiling like oh, I don't want to talk. Well, well Senator, I, I think we all understand where the commonality is, right? It's right. about time limits. It's about avoiding duplication. It's about making sure that we have a process to to pay for things, particularly transmission. You could turn the dials too far on any one of those issues. Those all, though, are the three legs of the stool. And I think we have all, in different ways, said the same thing, which is you can do it in two years. And you can do it in two years without transgressing on good process while making it possible for states and localities and tribes and communities to be part of that process. And so I think you know, our argument is just, just take don't, the win. Take don't the win. dial it too take the hard. Win. Yeah. OK. Yeah, Anybody, anything else, Mr. Nolan? Yeah, I think what uh, Jason said is, is spot on. There's obviously a, a massive consensus coming together here that I think we can all build on. Um, there are things that we all want, but maybe that doesn't come this time around. You know, the miners are very patient, but we, we'd love to see this advance. Um, and of course, first, do no harm. Okay. There are suggestions about turning the mining platform into a leasing system, which would be very devastating to the industry. Yeah, from a workforce perspective? Okay. Yeah, I would agree with what Jason said um, about turning the dials too far in one direction. I mean, we definitely still need that, um, you know, the ability for communities and states and tribes to participate, but we want strict timelines because we need to get things built. So do something. <laughs> that would be what the workers would say is get something moving through Congress so that we can get more projects unleashed and have this promise of good jobs become a reality. Good. Mr. Ellick. Mr. Chairman, Senator, uh, very simply, uh, please don't add another layer of bureaucracy uh, throughout any of these measures. Uh, obviously, protecting our foundational energy statutes and, and making changes there is important, but uh, what has gotten us to uh, the situation we're in today is too much, too much, too much. We have a great opportunity to modernize and, and really create efficient permitting processes. Good. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Senator Cantwell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to the panel for being here. Hydropower makes up one-third of the renewable energy generated in the United States and two-thirds in my state. So uh, there's no way, in my opinion, that we can reach our net zero emission reduction goals without maintaining our existing hydroelectric generating capacity. I see already Mr. Grimmett uh, nodding there. Not only that, but hydro's ability to provide a firm dispatchable power, which is needed most and key ingredient when you're talking about intermittent power. So it's just the base load of base loads, in my opinion. Um, however, current licenses for over 450 hydro facilities, including pump storage projects, will expire in 2035. That's 17 
gigawatts of clean energy in jeopardy. In my state alone, there are 18 facilities whose licenses expire in 2035, representing uh, 1.3 gigawatts of capacity. So um, I understand that right now, on average, hydro release relicensing facilities take seven years. Now, I say, Mr. Chairman, my colleague Larry Craig and I worked on this. And uh, at the time, we thought the average was more than 10 years. We did a hydro relicensing -re bill, but I guess we shaved off three years. So now let's see what we can do, given that we have these urgent needs uh, to do even more. Yesterday, Senator Daines and I introduced a comprehensive hydro relicensing -re reform bill. It's supported by the National Hydro Power Association, the National Congress of American Indians, uh, both Democrat and Republican FERC commissioners, American Rivers, utilities like Seattle Light, and with streamlining the permitting process, increase tribal engagement and oversight, expedite low-impact projects, consider future climate impacts, promote healthy habits, and coordinate the federal decision. Mr. Uh, Gramey or Ms. Schuler, do you agree that baseload power is a key ingredient to the grid's future, and do, would you support legislation such as I just described in being part of the permitting reform process? So clean, non-carbon based load power is essential. Hydro is kind of the unsung hero of our clean energy system right now, and we really appreciate your leadership, as I know our colleagues do in the Hydro Association. The scope and scale of the challenge is profound. We cannot lose any non-carbon power, and that's the same for hydro, for nuclear, for the renewables industry. I think the legislation that you've proposed, which also focuses a lot on um, hydro and pump storage, is going to be essential to maintaining reliability. So. I think the Clean Power Association very much supports uh, your efforts and those of Senator Daines. Thank you. And Ms. Schuler, if I could add, do you also support trans... I know you're going to answer that question, but do you also support adding more needed transmission capacity? Because I think in the underlying HR 1, they don't address transmitting permitting reform, and this, too, is a big component of what we need to do. I say this because I'm so proud that you, as the first chair, AFL-CIO woman chair, but you come from a electricity background from Portland General Electric, I think, right? So I think this is a subject you know well. Yeah, and growing up in the shadow of, you know, the Bonneville Dam and very familiar with, with hydro uh, in the Northwest and um, the workforce that it takes to maintain the system and the frustration that we see when we can't get transmission expanded and make sure our supply is, is um, you know, uh, affordable and reliable. Um, so I would just say to echo your concerns, you know, having 30% of our renewable energy supply come from hydro, we need to protect it. We need to do better. We need to speed up the process. So we absolutely agree with, um, with your assessment. And just knowing that these hydro plants need to be periodically re-licensed, right? And I think it's 450 dams with 17 gigawatts of clean power need to be re-licensed by 2035, as I think you said. So um, we, need to, we need to do better, and we support that. And, 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 and transmission reform, as transmission permitting as part of this reform bill yes. should be considered as well. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Daines. Chair Manchin, thank you. Uh, the National Environmental Policy Act's current regulations impose significant time and significant cost burdens with an environmental impact statement, adding an average now of over $4 million to each project and taking four and a half years to complete. For hard rock mining, it routinely takes now over 10 years and a billion dollars in startup capital before a company produces any product in America. And that's if they ever get through the permitting process. More often than not, we've got a situation where projects like the Libby Exploration Project that used to be called Montanor, it's in northwestern Montana, they've been in an endless cycle of permitting and litigation now for 34 years. It's going to be producing minerals and metals that are needed for the future renewable energy economy. There's no one in sight. This forces us to depend on countries like China and the Democratic Republic of Congo for critical minerals and materials. Permitting reform is needed now. And it needs to be comprehensive, it needs to include forestry reforms to prevent unnecessary delays from endangering our forests and our hydropower reforms so we can continue to use and benefit from this clean, low-cost energy source. 
Next week, we're taking up my bipartisan Ninth Circuit Cottonwood fix and passing it in committee. This needs to be part of permitting. Yesterday, Senator Cantwell and I introduced the Community and Hydropower Improvement Act. That was a year in the making. This bill is the largest hydropower bill in two decades. And I thank Senator Cantwell for being a great partner. Two senators from the northwest part of the United States that understand the importance of hydropower. It's streamlined. I'd like to join you both. <laughs> yes. We'd love to have you. Thank you. It streamlined. Without, with, without any discussion there, we're going to add Senator Wyden. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it, it streamlines the permitting and licensing process. It increases tribal consultation, balances stream and species protection with increased support of hydropower production. You know, hydropower produces a third of all renewable energy and over 6% of all electricity in the United States this bipartisan permitting bill must be included in any package that comes before the United States Senate. Mr. Gramey, pumped hydropower storage is the largest and most valuable storage solution for intermittent wind and solar. The Community and Hydropower Improvement Act makes many permitting challenges, including creating an expedited three-year process for pumped storage. Can you speak about the need to include a hydropower reform in the permitting discussion and specifically the importance of expediting pumped storage? Yeah. Well, thank you, Senator Daines. I think, you know, broadly, as I shared with Senator Cantwell, it is hard to imagine a solution that addresses our security, economic, and climate challenges by mid-century that does not have a significant reliance on continued hydropower. We certainly cannot move backwards. And pump storage is now an essential component of that transition because, as you point out, it is essential to make sure that the grid is reliable while we have increasing amounts of wind and solar. We're also very optimistic about efforts underway with battery technology. And so we think the combination of pumped hydro and the tremendous growth in battery storage is going to provide that kind of resilience. And I think in terms of permitting the timelines, maybe just to take this more broadly, you know, the challenge we've had over permitting is some people have sought it as a way to slow things down because they felt like what we were building was not consistent with our national needs. What has changed, and I give this committee the credit for making this happen, is now we all have a vision of what success looks like. Hydro is part of that success. Hard rock mining is part of that success. Onshore wind, offshore wind, battery storage. And now that we all have line of sight towards success, I think we all want to come together and get things done. And I think two years has kind of landed as that reasonable space to make these decisions in a way that involve communities, respect outcome, and actually deliver for the American people. Thanks for those thoughtful comments. Uh, Mr. Nolan, permitting reform without litigation reform, in this center's opinion, is pointless. It doesn't matter how long it takes to get a permit, if that permit is going to be endlessly litigated by a radical outside group. And Montana mines are not alone. The litigation cycle is a problem across the United States. I bring in this chart for the Rock Creek timeline to remind my colleagues of the problem. That chart starts in 1987. I used to work for Procter & Gamble, I used to make things like shampoo. That's lather, rinse, repeat right there. Over and over and over again. That started in 1987, and here we are in 2023. Mr. Nolan, how can we fix the litigation problem? And do you agree we need to have this at the forefront of our discussions? Senator Daines, thanks for the question. I believe you're, you're spot on. Uh, it currently takes seven to 10 years no, to time. get through the permitting process alone. And with your example aside, on average, it's another three to five years of litigation. Now, we're not saying that challenges and the right of the people to make their point should be eliminated, but that challenge should be within scope and, and targeted to uh, substantial matters oh, and upfront so that the project can be adjusted and public concerns addressed. So I fully agree that without uh, legal reform and judicial reform in this package, the permitting process improvements are gonna have very yeah. limited impact. And I'm over time, I'm very concerned Thanks. that we, we could spike the ball with a great permitting reform bill, get it passed, yeah. and then find out what the mercies of this continuous litigation cycle here 
and, and obstruct these projects in court. Thank, Thank you. you, Senator. Thank you. Senator yep. Wyden. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and it's wonderful to have Elizabeth Schuler in the House. She and I have known each other since I was co-director of the Oregon Gray Panthers, the senior citizens group. She was coming up in the labor movement. We are so proud that she holds this position. It's just wonderful to have you here today, point one. Point number two, and then I've got a question. June 2012 was a really big time in the debate about energy policy. The chairman, I want Chairman Manchin to hear this in case I make a mistake in the history. Chairman Manchin invited Senator Murkowski and I to come to West Virginia to take a tour of all of the energy sources and to kind of talk about where we were going. So I spent a lot of time thinking about the issue and we started talking to Chairman Manchin's staff. This was over a decade ago and we saw a variety of sources and I'd spent a lot of time boning up on some of the things that Chairman Manchin was talking about. And he was very interested in the concept of technological neutrality. That is now the permanent position of the United States with respect to energy policy. Everybody's in. Technological neutrality really grew out of those meetings that we started in June of 2012. Mm -hmm. Then we said, we're going to have a private sector built system. Not just going to have a full array of choices, but it's going to be built around the private sector. And then, because I read a bunch of Chairman Manchin's speeches, I said, we're going to have to have a coalition. We're going to have to bring together Democrats and Republicans, as Chairman Manchin talks about. I said, and I held my breath, we also ought to say, the more you reduce carbon emissions, the bigger your tax savings. And I was pretty junior on the Senate Finance Committee, and I certainly wasn't thinking about being the chair in the next 10 minutes. But Chairman Manchin said then, and he was not the chairman of the committee, that's something that rewards people in the private sector. And so for 10 years, we nurtured that concept along. Private sector, technologically neutral, reward in the private sector, people who reduce carbon emissions. And now we have seen this is the biggest investment in climate and, as Chairman Manchin has always talked about, a sensible energy policy for the future. It brings together both sides. And I just put it in the context of energy security and climate, making a beginning at tackling climate. So now we face the question of what comes next. And I'm very troubled about the fact that after we made all that progress over 10 years, we still get held up in red tape and bureaucracy for solar and wind and geothermal, which is, as President Schuler knows, a big deal in our part you know, of, of the world. And Chairman Manchin and I talked about that back then. And I've supported this effort for permitting reform. And I think the question I'd like to ask you, Ms. Schuler, is what's the extra benefit your members get from permitting reform? Because it strikes me we've all been kind of talking around that. But you always speak the language of working families and working people. So I'd like you to kind of spell out for the committee representing Oregon and the country as it relates to working families, what's the extra plus that your members get from the kind of efforts we're making on permitting reform? Well, and thank you, Senator, and, and to you, Mr. Chairman, and, um, and all of you really thinking about workers and making this a worker-centered issue because often workers' perspectives are left behind. Uh, especially when we're talking about changes in the energy industry. And I earlier had mentioned this notion of just transition. Um, everyone talks about it, but we need to make it a reality. And if we cannot get these projects built, workers get frustrated. They lose hope. Uh, they see, um, you know, the potential, but they don't see the actual jobs manifesting themselves uh, in their communities. And so I think it's um, a both and. We can do permitting reform and speed up these processes and we can continue to make sure we're hearing from the right 
perspectives, workers included, who live in, in communities where these changes are taking place. Um, but we need to do it with speed, we need to do it with certainty, and we also know that it takes time to train workers to uh, get prepared for these jobs. And so now when we have, if we have certainty, developers are actually gonna be uh, attracting investment. And so work will then be certain, and then we can start training workers to make sure that we have good, high-quality jobs for the future. Well said, and my, my, my time is up. Going all the way back to those conversations that began in June of 2012, we always said that the needs of workers and energy security and a sensible climate policy, these were not mutually exclusive. We could have all three with the right kind of policy. We are now started in that direction. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. I just want to clarify one thing. The whole purpose of the IRA is energy security. This administration has been unable to use the word energy security. All they use is climate. And I have corrected them, and I will continue to correct them. It's energy security. We can't run this country without the horsepower of clean fossil. We can't do it. And we're not going to basically put our grid system and the reliability in, in, in uh, jeopardy. With that, we can walk and chew gum. And that's what we've been saying from day one. We can invest in the technology of the future that we're all going to need and mature that. But we're not going to eliminate something before we have something to replace it with. And if you don't like what we're doing and you think we're doing something wrong by having fossil and, and clean technology, go look at Europe. Look at what happened. We're not going to repeat that mistake. Senator Hawley. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to the witnesses for being here. Mr. Schiller, I want to start with you and talk a little bit about permitting reform for mining critical minerals. But before I get to that, I just want to say uh, thank you to you and to your, the rail workers that you represent for their work in transporting much of this nation's critical energy supply. And I just want to reiterate that I think that the deal, so-called, that uh, the rail workers were forced to accept at the hand of this Congress last year, where they were not given one additional sick day, one that they were requesting, it's frankly outrageous. That's why I voted against it. Uh, I would have amended it uh, to include uh, the sick days that the rail workers were looking for. And I think, frankly, the idea that the rail workers of this country, who risk their safety in many cases day in and day out, and certainly uh, put their health on the line to provide for their families and do so much for our energy sector, couldn't have one additional sick day while probably half of the federal government still isn't showing up to work because they're afraid they might get sick is just frankly outrageous. So thank you for your advocacy on their behalf. Um, let me ask you about uh, mining and critical minerals here in the United States. You're the president of a trade association that, that represents labor unions. Can you give us just a, a thumbnail sketch, and I apologize if you've already been asked this, but can you give us a thumbnail sketch of some of the protections that domestic workers here in the United States get for mining projects? So talk to us about the labor protections that we have in, in this country to help keep them safe. Well, as you know, the mining industry is one of the most union-dense industries. We have uh, prote safety protections because of the fact that it is highly unionized, and uh, we've been able to negotiate over time uh, very strong protections in their union contracts. So let's, let's talk about where much of the world's critical mineral supply comes from if it's outside of the United States, and that's Chinese mines in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And I bet you're aware of, of the labor conditions there in the Democratic Republic of Congo. For instance, it's been recently reported that about 40,000 children are working in the mines in the Southern Democratic Republic of uh, Congo. A recent NPR article called those labor conditions modern day slavery. Would you agree with me that our labor protections in this country are a heck of a lot better? They may not be perfect, but they're a heck of a lot better than labor protections the, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, if they exist at all. Yes, and that's why we need a more robust domestic supply chain. You have, you have made my point for me. Uh, that is ex ex I couldn't agree with you more. And uh, this is why I have to say I, I don't understand this administration's decision uh, to sign an agreement just last month to fund critical mining projects in the Congo, while at the same time they are denying permits for domestic mining here in this country. And I had the chance to talk with the Secretary of the Interior about this just the other day. In, in that connection, can I just ask you, if you, for your personal opinion, do you think that we have too many good paying union jobs in this country? Too many good paying blue collar jobs? 
I think that's rhetorical, right? <laughs> <laughs> I would hope so. I would hope so, but I'm You never have enough too many good union you. paying jobs. Yeah, thank you. Well, I'm asking because when I raise this issue, specifically as it relates to opening up more mines in this country with our protections, creating more good paying jobs in this country, the uh, Secretary of the Interior told me last month that uh, she pointed out to me that, well, there's, there's 1.9 jobs for every American in the country, so there's a lot of jobs, and, and right now, you know, we've got basically too many jobs. I just think that that's outrageous. I just think that's totally outrageous. We need more good paying jobs in this country, which is why we need realistic, serious permitting reform that will make those jobs available, secure our critical supply chains, and get our workers back to work. Thank you for the work you're doing in that, in that respect. In my few remaining minutes here, seconds rather, <laughs> the chairman, already, I've hardly been on this committee and already I have a bad reputation with the chairman. Yes, all right, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to stay within my bounds. Uh, Mr. Grumman, let me just ask you about the Grain Belt Express. Are, are you familiar with this transmission project called the Grain Belt Express? Yeah. Um, a company called Invariant, as you know then, has been trying to build, it's, it's a wind uh, energy transmission project, runs across my state, Missouri, uh, Kansas and Illinois. It has been subject to, to multiple steps of approval process in the state of Missouri, and I'm sure in, in, in the neighboring states, but I'm more familiar with Missouri. These are state-level agencies. My question to you is, do you think the states ought to have the authority in transmission projects like this to review and, and grant approval or not? So now I'm not going to get you in trouble by answering your question, right, Mr. Chairman? Um, so absolutely the states have a role and have to have a role. But that role has to be guided with the same kind of deliberate national interest that we've been talking about. When Congress passed EPAC 2005 and said that there were transmission interests that were in the national interest, it recognized that we are one nation, that electricity moves very quickly, covers far distances, and we have to be able to bring that larger vision so that we actually protect ourselves as a nation and as a community. So I think it is not a yes or no. It is not an either or. The current system is not working to protect the state of Missouri or the state of Texas or the state of Vermont because we're balkanized. The answer is not federalization. We've proposed a number of specific reforms that we think can find the right way to balance those two things so that we actually have an electric grid that does protect our population, keeps the lights on, keeps businesses humming, and provides clean power. I would agree with you that the answer is not federalization. And I will just say that I think it's, it's vital that we allow state agencies that are responsive to farmers and ranchers in the state to be able to review and have a say in this process and not just be ramrodded by, uh, uh, and railroaded, if you like, by, by something. I bet we could come up with a set of criteria that would make us all feel pretty good. I hope so. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Hickenlooper. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you all for being here and for all your effort and uh, service. Um, uh, Mr. Grume, uh, global, clean ener clean, global clean energy development uh, trends have flipped in the last decade um, and really not in a good way for the United States. Uh, a lot of us are very concerned that uh, the United States, the European Union, are in a race with the uh, People's Republic of China uh, on clean energy, uh, and we're not coming out as well as one would have expected even in the recent past. Uh, one example, last year China installed more rooftop solar than any other country installed rooftop so solar, utility-grade wind, and utility-grade solar all combined. Uh, I know your organization is watching the renewable development around our geopolitical peer rivals abroad. How did this change happen, and what can we do to, to, to reverse it? Well, thank you for the question, Senator. I think it's worth reflecting. We spent the first beginning of this conversation talking about permitting and transmission, and now we're talking about the third fundamental challenge to success, which is supply chain. You are absolutely right that 20 years ago, we started to cede authority to China. While the goal of the permanent normalization of trade relations was that it was going to open their markets to ours and it was going to reform their human rights, it fundamentally failed. So now, game on. It's time for America to start fighting back and bringing these resources back to this country. The only way that's going to happen, though, is if our government works with our industry. So for the last several years, we've been dealing with basically punitive tariffs, thinking that the way we're going to support American companies is by somehow punishing them for trying to build domestic manufacturing. I think there's a huge opportunity now with the incentives for advanced manufacturing that are coming out of recent congressional efforts to bring those companies back. Just in the last nine months, we've had 30 new domestic solar manufacturers announced in this country, 30. 
right, in nine months, almost one a week. That is the trend that we have to continue, but that's only going to continue with partnership, and we also have to be realistic. You can't turn off 20 years of a vicious cycle in 15 days. We're going to have to acknowledge that a dramatic amount of infrastructure and intellectual property is no longer in this country, Great. and we're going to have to work to bring it back. Appreciate that. Thank you. Um, uh, Ms. Schuler, uh, in your written testimony, you talked about uh, the Trans West Line that's being built in Wyoming um, as the former governor of the state just to the south of Wyoming. Uh, I'm fully aware that part of that line goes through northwestern Colorado, that it took 18 years. Uh, finally, it looks like we're going to get it done. Uh, as someone who uh, has a child, uh, an infant at home, that child's going to be in college uh, by the time someone could do a similar process uh, to permit a single transmission line. Can you speak to the opportunity that America's labor force, um, that, that building a, a large-scale transmission line like this, what did it, it means, uh, what it represents, and what we leave on the table when our federal policy doesn't allow this to happen? Yeah, I mean, transmission is, is central. It's, it's critically important um, to everything we want to do in this country, especially with all these investments coming down the pike. Um, and so shortening the siting process is absolutely critical. Um, and we all know, as, as Jason was saying, that we need lots of different forms of supply coming into our system, and they're often generated long distances away from where the load centers are. So that's why it's so essential that we turn our attention to this and we do it urgently. Um, the other thing from a worker perspective, I mentioned this earlier, is this notion of making sure we have the skilled workforce to handle it. Transmission is, is um, complicated, right? It's, you don't just make a power lineman overnight, and especially in the, in the higher end of the spectrum on, on high voltage transmission. So uh, we need that certainty to be able to plan for the trajectory of the talent pipeline that we're gonna need. And so I think that, um, uh, that permitting reform piece is gonna unlock a lot of opportunity for workers of the future. All right, well, thank you and we agree. And I don't have a, enough time for other um, answers, but I will leave you with a, a question because it applies to each one of you. And you've all talked about this along, whether we're talking about transmission lines or, or natural gas pipelines, we're talking about opening mines. The workforce challenges are apparent for every one of you. And I think we, I would love to at some point have the same group to be able to talk about where are these kids going to come from? How do we get to them soon enough to and allow them the opportunity to see which, which trade, which profession, which career they would be happiest in, and then make sure they get the training in real time? Because I think that's going to come down over the next few years as being one of the single most fundamental challenges and obstacles in front of us in terms of achieving what each of you have been talking about. So file that away. I'll, I'll put it in as a written Better. question. Listen, I have a plan. We'll, we'll stop by. <laughs> Perfect. I yield back to the chair. Oh, thank you, Senator. Sorry. <laughs> well, you've always been kind on your time. I appreciate it. Uh, Senator, uh, it's so good to see you, Senator Hovind. Hi. You're up, sir. You're up. You're up. Go for it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for holding the hearing today. Uh, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a letter from the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association dated May 8th, 2023, regarding the association's principles for permitting reform. I ask for UC. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Most North Dakotans are served by rural electric cooperatives, which are nonprofit entities whose mission is to provide reliable electric service to rural customers at the lowest possible cost. At last week's hearing with the FERC commissioners, Senator Lee raised concerns over proposals that would socialize the cost of large transmission lines and potentially force ratepayers in states to pay more for electricity without any benefits. In the letter, the NRECA emphasizes that any changes to transmitting, transmission permitting and siting process should ensure that any costs are only allocated to, quote, those who receive tangible and quantifiable benefits, end quote. I share these concerns raised by the rural electric cooperatives. Uh, North Dakota shouldn't be forced to pay for transmission lines that simply benefit other states and not North Dakota as well. Uh, with that, um, Mr. Ulrich, I've got a bill we call the BLM Mineral Spacing Act, 
And essentially what it says is that uh, if the federal government owns no surface acres and a minority of the mineral acres, then they shouldn't be required, or then they should not, it, it should not be a requirement that they're involved in the permitting process so that the state can go ahead and permit it and not have to do federal permitting as well. Would you agree with that? And, and uh, would that help us produce more energy for this great nation? Yes, yeah, Senator, not familiar with your bill, but with concept, absolutely. Uh, those are challenges we have in the eastern parts of the state of Wyoming, Fifi yeah, Fed, uh, you, know, where, yeah, you know, where a federal agency uh, has a, a minority uh, of, of interest in, in the leasehold, if any, but there is a federal nexus. Uh, thus, uh, what should be a very simple arrangement between the private landowners and mineral owners and the operator becomes very complicated, costly, and timely uh, in the tune of years for a permitting process, uh, which is completely unnecessary. So, Senator, uh, it, yes, w without understanding clearly the, the language of the bill, I love the philosophy. Yeah, right on. So, Mr. Nolan... Um uh, rare earth elements. So uh, in lignite coal, which, which we have in our state, um, the uh, lignite contains high concentrations of rare earth elements, and, and that's true even as reg uh, in regard, uh, relation to other types of coal. Our North Dakota Geological Survey has released a series of studies examining locations of potential resources, and the University of North Dakota is researching how to... Uh, more efficiently and affordably extract these rare earth elements from lignite coal. Do you agree that leveraging coal-derived rare earth and critical minerals is needed to address the su supply chain disruptions and lessen our reliance on China? Thank you for the question, Senator Hoven. Absolutely. We need all mineral sources we can find. The forecast for future demand from uh, world resources demanding minerals, whether it's lithium or cobalt or rare earth elements is going to uh, explode exponentially. So we need all sources, including rare earth elements from coal and lignite. Okay. How do we um, improve the technology so that we can commercialize this and do it more, you know, in a, in a commercially viable way? And sync that up with how, you know, we're, we're utilizing this coal to produce low-cost electricity, we're capturing the CO2 with these new technologies, and then if we can come back and capture these uh, rare earth elements, seems like a triple win f for the citizens of this country rather than getting our energy from somebody else, right? So how do we do that? What, what are your ideas to help? I mean, it's a, it's a challenge of, of getting this to scale. The, 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 the amount and the size of those elements in, in the geology is, is, is very small, so you really have to move a lot of earth to get to it, and then it's really important to reshore our processing capabilities. Okay, now you've identified so we don't have to this challenge. I, want you, I, I, I appreciate that. I'd rather have you identify a solution. We have to invest in processing of those rare earth elements here at home so we're not shipping them to China and coming back. What does that mean, invest in processing? Uh, standing up the facilities that can actually take the raw rare earths, break them apart into their elements, so, when Chairman so they're Manchin, marketable. When Chairman Manchin comes to you and says, what's the single best thing he could do to get this done, you would tell him to do what? And I know he would certainly respect your advice on this. Well, he's done a tremendous amount of work in this space already and has invested a heck of a lot of uh, federal resources in, so it's the, in the technology. It's really how we get it to scale, which I believe was your question. Yeah. And that is to build an industry that can take the raw material, process it here, not overseas. And is that a function of R&D, or what is it? It's R&D, it's feed, it's uh, capital investment, it's, um, it's permits. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank Absolutely. you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. And now we have finally <laughs> the great senator from Nevada, the senior senator from Nevada, Cortez Masta. Senator Cortez Masta. Thank you to the chairman. Thank you to the panelists. This has been an incredible discussion today, bipartisan discussion. I think there is uh, room for agreement that I've heard on several in several areas here today. Um, many of you know Nevada. It is the growing uh, nexus for our clean energy and critical uh, mineral future uh, because it really is the only state uh, in the United States that encompasses nearly every facet of the critical mineral advanced battery uh, economy from the mining of the critical mineral deposits to the research and development to the processing and manufacturing 
uh, and finally to the recycling operations, all done with union labor. And so th this really is a great opportunity where we can all work together a as we take the ne necessary steps to address climate change. We have to do so in a fashion that makes America more productive, secure, and self-sufficient. That's what I've heard today, and I agree with it. At the very basic level, this means we must produce minerals in the United States and not solely rely on foreign sources. Uh, I believe we can do this in a way that incorporates robust engagement with all stakeholders and still looks to protect the environment. Does anybody disagree with that on the panel? Everybody's shaking their head no. Correct, because I think there is that opportunity. Thank you. Um, Mr. Nolan, let me start with you. The administration, the Biden administration, has repeatedly referenced the importance of domestically sourced critical minerals, noting that, and I quote, critical minerals provide the building blocks for many modern technologies like batteries, electric vehicles, wind turbines, and solar panels, and are essential to our national security and economic prosperity. Global demand for these critical minerals is set to skyrocket by 400 to 600 percent over the next several decades, and for minerals such as lithium and graphite, demand will increase by as much as 4,000 percent. So, Mr. Nolan, how is our ability to meet what you just heard, the Biden administration's climate goals, how is that impacted by the Ninth Circuit, the Rosemont decision? And how is our ability to develop domestic critical minerals impacted by that decision? Senator, thank you for the question. Uh, first off, I want to congratulate, congr congratulate your state of Nevada for being the number one destination worldwide for minerals investment uh, just announced this year. So congratulations. Thank you. Um, the Rosemont decision has had a significant chilling effect on projects being uh, able to expand and move forward. Um, I think there is a, a, a very important piece of legislation that you've brought forward to clarify the important um, regulations and codify them that allow for ancillary use on public lands to make sure that we can continue to produce and meet the minerals and necessary needs that are currently now being sourced back and forth from China to the United States. So I appreciate your leadership on, on that issue and leadership uh, on the subcommittee of mining for this committee. Thank you. Uh, and I, I, I want to note that we just had, uh, there's a recent editorial in the Las Vegas Sun um, saying that Rosemont is a wake-up call. Um, and it referenced the decision, and it said, and I quote, the mining industry needs to work harder on environmental issues and also pressure the bad actors among them to reform their ways. Simultaneously, environmentalists who want to see the green energy revolution continue suddenly have a deeply vested interest in the success of mining for minerals essential for that future. We have labor, we have clean energy, we have mining at the table before us. Um, let me ask you, Mr. Nolan, maybe start with you, what, what will your industries be doing to work with all the stakeholders to find that path? Because I do think there is a path forward. We are constantly uh, outreaching in the local communities with our members to make sure that we're doing front-end consultation with tribes, with uh, um, local community stakeholders to make sure that we have the input as these projects come forward because there has been a sea change in understanding about the importance of what we need to do to get these minerals to the marketplace so that we can bring forward these new technologies and really support the electrification of the economy. Anyone else regarding that engagement? I'm Master, curious. I just in terms of the moment we're in, you know, I'm here on behalf of the clean energy industry, which is the energy industry. The scope and scale of we have, what we have to achieve at this country can only happen if all of the different aspects of the energy industry are coming together. And that's why we are working closely with Rich's organization, with the uh, American Petroleum Institute, with the Interstate National Gas Association, with the Nuclear Energy Institute, because the equation is that we need clean energy for security and climate. We need critical minerals for clean energy. There's no way around that equation. And if we don't do it here in the U.S., we do not achieve those national security benefits. So, Look, I think, you know, I think we've given you all an easy job here to simply just put all of this consensus together into a nifty piece of legislation. <laughs> Mr. Owen. Mutual. Uh, it, Senator, from a natural gas perspective, we need to ensure that we have credible and transparent emission reduction measures and numbers in place. We're doing that at Jonah Energy. That's why we signed on to the oil and gas methane project, first U.S.-based company to do it. Um, the American public, you, and everybody else deserves to have a very clear understanding 
of where we stand with em emission reductions and how good we can get. And we're, we're well on our way. Thank you. I know my time is almost up. Can I just touch on the workforce piece? Because I think this is crucial. Uh, it's, a, it's important that we include that development, that apprenticeship, that we are including that workforce in this future. And so, um, Ms. Schuler, do you have any other thoughts on uh, how we continue to support that workforce? Well, workers will be at the center of all of this. I said in my opening that nothing, permitting reform affects every aspect of the economy, if you think about it. And we haven't talked a lot about manufacturing and siting a lot of these facilities, these chip fabs, you know, the battery and EV facilities. But I think the idea here is constructive partnerships. And you've seen it here. And we think labor can actually be a bridge, can be the place where everybody can, you know, coalesce. Uh, so we want to play that role and we want to help you get there. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, I know my time is up. One final thing. Uh, you, you touched it on, on your opening. Royalties. Let me just say, thank you for the hearing we had last Congress, because we had that discussion. We had mining at the table, and if I recall, mining was willing to be a part of that discussion and a part of how we address that issue of your concern. Yeah. On behalf of the entire committee here, I want to thank you all. It's been a wonderful uh, hearing. I think everyone's enjoyed it. The most important thing is we're going to make something happen, and you're going to be a very big part of that. I hope you all been thinking about the first question I asked you about the three. If you will share that with us, uh, the three that you have, and I want to say a few other things on that the, the senator brought up. So many good points. Um, the whole thing that we're trying to do is mature an industry. I want people to know that also carbon capture sequestration. If the EPA does not give us permits for for uh, class six wells, which they have not. That means they're trying to strangle you with a thousand cuts. They're trying to go one way without the other. They know it's a balanced approach. So don't tell me that you're going to invest in carbon capture sequestration when we can't get a permit to basically sequester the carbon capture that we capture. This is the, this is the games being played. I know it, they know I know it, and we're not gonna let them get away with it. And we will shut everything down until they start playing exactly how the bill was written and the intent. So I want all of you to know that very clearly. So if you can talk to the administration, tell them we're all on the same side. We want energy security. We want fossil cleaner than anywhere in the world. And we want to develop the new technology for the future. That's not too hard to understand in that bill. That's what we call energy security. So you want us to reveal, reveal to us your three top picks. Mr. Ork, we'll start with you. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And uh, OK. Uh, Number one, two, and three. Yep, number one, uh, it, it, meaningful NEPA reform. Gotcha. Uh, and that is certainly on tiering. Uh, obviously, expedite judicial review periods. Review Two, periods. Gotcha. three, prioritize LNG exports uh, uh, out of the Rockies to the West Coast. Great. President? Echo that. Timelines for NEPA reviews, um, deadlines for those environmental impact state, um, statements so that we can create certainty for developers. Um, the second thing, I guess, would the enabling the president um, to designate a list of priority projects for permitting so that we can raise up critical minerals and, and transmission as part of that. Um, expand eligibility for federal permitting improvement steering committee programs to include energy projects, new technology, and critical minerals mining, et cetera. Those are the three. Mr. Nolan. Well, first, I want to echo your comments about CCS. If that doesn't work, it's a dead end for us. So, Well, you know, it's no different than we did with uh, what we've done with uh, uh, capturing methane. And let me just tell you the crazy thing about capturing. I have to bring this up. I couldn't figure out. I said, why are we flaring so much out west on public lands? Why are we flaring so much? And then they basically want to shut everybody down because you're flaring methane. That's a, that's, it's, it's, a, it's a marketable product. They, can't get a, they cannot get a permit for a pipeline to take the methane off, so they're killing them with a 1,000 cuts. So we said, fine. There's no fine. You cannot fine them if you won't give them a permit to take the product to market. Just common sense stuff, right? Go ahead. I'm sorry. So in the Hard Rock, I guess I would start with ancillary use and clarif clarifying uh, that, that provision in that uh, decision. We need to get that fixed. We've talked a lot about legal challenge limitations. Uh, to your EIS uh, is something I think that you've you've supported in the past, and then certainly certainly this committee has done a lot of work on, in, in, with their concern about uh, the reliability issues of the grid and making sure we can keep our optionality open with the coal fleet. Thank you, 
Mr. Grimman. Senator Manchin, I want to start by saying I agree with you on CCS. I also should tell you that my wife started working at EPA about six months ago, so you may be undermining marital bliss in this um, <laughs> situation. We got hope now. Maybe we got uh, hope. The top three. <laughs> Transmission with a focus on connecting the balkanized interregions together. NEPA reform, but I'll also add with a focus on public lands, particularly the Outer Continental Shelf. We are really losing opportunities when it comes to the tremendous offshore wind possibility. And then I'm gonna add a little more on the spiritual side. All of the above, competition with purpose, right? The place where this debate goes off the rails is when people think that all of the above means we have empty minds. We don't have empty minds. We want a competition of all these different technologies to achieve security, economic growth, and climate security. And so I think if we understand that, if the people outside of this room understood that that's what you were all saying, we'd be in a much better place. And finally, I'll say this before we adjourn. I would like for all of you and everyone in the room here, if you will, when you leave this room, support bipartisan permitting reform. Not my bill, not Senator Brasso's bill, not Senator Capito's bill, not Senator Carper's bill, whoever's putting bills in. We need a little bit of all four of them to make this work. And if we go out and say, well, I support this one and that one, it just divides us further. We can get together much quicker if we're all in this. And I think we are. We want this done and everybody wants it done. With that, uh, the committee will have until the close of business tomorrow to submit additional questions for the record. I again thank you all.